and this is true whether you're talking about software. So let's do a quick show of hands. I'll step back up here. Who here is in a, a, is a technologist, a developer, an architect, or, or in some way deeply involved in technology? All right, fantastic. Who here considers themselves to be a leader? Right, very good. Uh, why were those technologists not putting their hands up? Your leaders too. Right. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh -huh. Technology. I've been up here trying to get this to work. And it did. That was my backup slides if this didn't work. But this is now working, so I can use this. Fantastic. Certain uncertainty. So, let me give you a little bit of history. Let's talk about why the hell we are here today. Over the last 30 years, a number of interesting things have occurred. And it's all bad in the most part. The average age of companies has dropped by more than 50 years in the last decade. Right? Since 1983, 57% of the Fortune 100 companies no longer exist. These are the companies that have gone bankrupt, that have gone through an acquisition. Right? These are companies who have just sort of failed in insignificance. The largest companies in America no longer exist. And these aren't the old companies. This is, yes, for every Kodak and for, and for every Chrysler, there are a hundred other organizations that were there and are now not. So, business agility. This is the day. This is the track that we're talking about today. There's a context to this conversation. Some of you might have Actually, no, let me take a step backwards. What does business agility mean to you? I won't ask you to tell me, all right, but just think about it. 10 seconds. What is business agility in your head? For some people, it's around product ownership. We're doing Scrum, so business agility means we're going to get the business involved. And that's a part of it. For others, it's about empowerment, it's about team and structure. Who here has heard of the Spotify model? There we go. Right. So, other people, it's more about leadership. It's more about the qualities of, of uh, how leaders work. And for others, it's about taking Agile, Scrum, and Kanban out of IT and applying it to other domains. Talent, HR, marketing. There is no definition of what business agility is. And, to be honest, nor can there be. For my sins, I run the Business Agility Institute, which is a brand new organization. But I, before that, I also put together the Business Agility Conference in New York. When I put on the conference, this was a community event. All of us were volunteers putting this together. And we had this idea, this goal, that let's bring all the Agilists together to talk about what business agility means and to come up with a definition. But as the conference got closer and closer, we realized that that was a foolish thing to do. Any definition that we put together, in a, especially in something that is as formative a state as business agility, would be so general as to be useless, or it would be so specific as to alienate half the community, all of the business agility. So instead, we decided not to do that. We had the conference, and it was a success, and we had some great talks. Biart was there. Right? So what we then decided was, let's, we still need something. And this is the something that we came up with. This is what we call the domains of business agility. Or as I like to think of it, this is the do not forget this model. This is not a framework to tell you what to do or how to do it. It's just telling you things not to forget. You're going through an agile transformation. Right? You're adopting Scrum, Kanban. Right? You've watched Linda's great talks on experimentation or growth mindset. You've got all this in your head. But if you're going to go through this change, if you want to be an adaptive future organization, don't forget. Right? So we put these domains in really four dimensions, so in three dimensions. Work, the ways of working, the ways of delivering and creating value. Connections, which is the relationships that exist within organizations. And mindset, right? culture. I'm going to take some of these in turn and just explore them briefly with you and give you some examples of where organizations are taking them. Right? 
Now, because we are in Agile India, I'm not going to spend too much time focusing on the Agile part of it. I am presuming you know what Agile is, the manifesto and all that history. Instead, I'm going to talk about the agility in the wider, broader context. So the heart of the model is our customer. Right? And we put the customer at the very center of our model because they don't exist anywhere else. Right? It, it, as Steve Denning say, um, said in, in an earlier talk I watched of his, right? looking for org chart, customer is not in your org chart. Right? The customer is not in your organization. And yet they're the very purpose we exist. They're the why we are in business. For those of you who saw me speak last year, uh, I talked a lot about outcomes and how to create outcomes and outcome profiles. Right? And I said then what I'll say now. You are not in business to make money. That is not your purpose. You have to make money. That's important. Right? And there's a great quote by Frederick Laloux. Profit is like air. We do not breathe to, sorry, do not live to breathe yet we do breathe in order to live. Right? And that's true. You have a purpose in your organization. A doctor becomes a doctor to save lives, to heal the sick. They don't become a doctor to make money. Well, a good doctor doesn't anyway. Most of them. <laughs> a, however, a doctor still needs to make money. Right? They have to make money so they can pay their insurance, so they can feed their family, so that they can continue to do their job. And this is true of your organization as well. Whether you are providing uh, who are the sponsors out there? Oil and Gas, uh, Ajira, uh, uh, Ajira Consultancy, or in the Consultancy. Uh, you're not in business uh, to make money. You're in business to help people. You're in business to power the world. Right? Pick your uh, slogan of choice. But they have to be more than just buzzwords. These have to be the very KPIs or a OKRs or outcome profiles that you exist with. Anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm rambling, so I apologize. But let's talk about how. If you want to be an agile organization, if you want your customer to be at the center of that model and the customer to be why you exist, you have to have trust. And trust is literally the point of, well, all of this. If you don't have trust, you will fail. Right? Or at least you cannot be agile without trust. This is what we call a pyramid of trust. Right? Let's say you're renovating your kitchen and you need a carpenter to come in. Right? So I'm going to come down and go, OK, uh, I need a good carpenter. Who's a good carpenter? Right? I read Yelp. Great. You've been recommended to me. You're the best carpenter around. I bring you in. I'm sorry. I don't trust you. I have no trust in you. I might trust Google. I might trust Yelp or my friend who recommended you. But I don't trust you. That's reference trust. I trust the reference. We go up a level. Contract-based trust. We agree on scope. We agree what you're going to do. Fantastic. Now, I don't, still don't trust you, but I trust the contract that we have. I cannot be agile with you if I trust the contract. Okay. It, it's very hard to write a contract in such a way that allows real agility. Because real agility requires levels of trust. By the way, that's not saying that if I do trust you, we don't have a contract. We'll always have a contract but the form and the terms of the contracts will differ between an agile organization and one that is not. Now, let's fast forward six months. You did a fantastic job on my kitchen. Great. Now, I want to do my bathroom. I'm not going to go to Google. I'm not going to go to my friend and ask for a recommendation. I'm going to come to you because I trust you. And then something wonderful and a bit strange happens. I am able to change the conversation. If I don't trust you, I'm going to ask the following question. How much will it cost? Right? Because I don't trust you to answer any other question. But now that I trust you, I might change the conversation. I might change the question. I've got $10,000, 50,000 rupees. What can you do with that? Now, think about the power in that question. I have trust with you. I know, and you can break that trust, you can pull me off, all right? All right? but that's a risk that we take in any trust relationship. All right? If a wife can definitely abuse the trust that I put in her, that doesn't mean I don't trust her. All right? So, I've given you a blessing. I've said, what can you do with this? And we're going to work together. And we're going to figure out 
based on what possible and what not, possible and what not, and we're going to create something that is agile. And I'm talking about doing my bathroom. There's no software in that, unless you have a really fancy bathroom. Okay? So, congratulations. We are now, I now have an agile relationship right, with a, a customer vendor relationship. Right? The customer is at the heart of the agility and can only happen when the customer has trust with you. Understood? Now, the top of the level is partnership. Now, I'm not going to enter into a joint venture with my plumber. Right? It's, it's just, it's, it's paid, the metaphor breaks down at this point. Right? But this is where we have shared outcomes. Right? Uh, Rolls Royce. Right? If you, Rolls Royce provides airplane engines, very big airplane engines. Right? And in about the 60s, 70s, that's embarrassing, I forget exactly when, they came up with a funding model for their engines. It's called Power by the Hour. And it's really fascinating because what happens is Rolls Royce will charge you for every hour that engine is in the sky. And they won't charge you if it's on the ground. It is the very definition of win-win. If the plane's in the sky, you're making money, and I'm making money. If the plane's on the ground, I'm not making any money, but neither are you. Right? So it's in our interest to have that plane in the sky. Right? And we have a mutually beneficial, literal win-win relationship. Right? That's what I mean by partnership. But let's go into sort of how. The customer is why. They are why you are in business, not money. And certainly not to, to, to grow market share, whatever your shareholders might think, but they're one business. So let's talk about your transformation. You're becoming an agile organization. Remember, this is don't forget model. These are things not to forget. Now, the work that you mentioned, I'm going to skip over pretty quickly because, once again, this is an agile conference and this is the domain of agile. And technical agility. This is the domain of DevOps and SP. This is the, I am physically creating something of value, and I'm doing so in an agile way. Right? Process agility. This is the domain of Scrum and Kanban. This is where we have a value stream, and that value stream generates, it's in the name, value. Right? This is the, and, and this is where organizations focus so much of their transformational energy transforming process. And that's fine if process is your constraining factor. I'll come to that in a second. The third domain under work is what we call enterprise agility. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Because this is now at a much broader level. We are now talking about agility across the entire organization. We are talking about agility between finance and HR and sales and marketing and your PMO. It's looking at the broader value stream and all of the handoffs and the pieces of the puzzle that go to making your organization work. Now, there's a concept um, which I talk about quite regularly. Um, if you haven't read, there's a book by Eli Goldratt called The Goal. In it, he talks about the theory of constraints. So allow me to very arrogantly introduce Evan's theory of agile constraints. An organization can only be as agile as its least agile part. Let's go back 30 years. All right? We're in the 1980s, the 1990s. Where is the constraining factor to agility in your organization? Right? We want to build a product, a software product, a tech software. Who's constraining our agility? Why? It's a software team. Software team, it takes them two to three years to build a product. Right? Um, we want to make changes. It's slow. It's, it's, it, it's painful. So what do we do? The 80s, it's the 90s, we invent Agile. Scrum, XP, RAD, Crystal Clear, you name the method, we invented it. Fantastic. Now let's fast forward, it's now about 10 years ago. We now have an engine that can make change every two weeks. Where's the constraint factor? Well, we still have to wait three months for a deployment window. So it doesn't matter how fast we can go, our, our concern to agility in the market, certainly, is deployment. So what do we do? We invent DevOps. Congratulations. We now have an engine. We create change every two weeks. 
We can deploy change. What's Amazon statistic? Every 11.6 seconds. Right? Where's the constraining factor of today in your organization? Right? Without knowing your organization, I will hazard a guess it's one of four places. It is either the PMO, it is finance, is HR, or it is legal, compliance. Right? Last? Yeah, okay, uh, I've hit a nerve. And in, in my experience, that, that tends to be where the constraint is these days. Which one depends on the organization in the bank, quite often um, the, the, the legal and compliance constraints. But let's take HR as an example. Right? You've got, I can make change every two weeks, I can release it every 11 seconds, but it takes me six to, um, six to 12 weeks to recruit the people I need to even get started. It doesn't matter how agile I am. My recruitment process is my constraining factor to my agility in this organization right now. It doesn't matter how much Scrum or Safe or Less or Kanban or whatever I put into my organization, because that's getting my process agility improved, but that is not where my constraining factor is. All right? I've already touched on that. So let's go to connection. These are the relationships. Within the, connections, within the connections dimension, that's a hard thing to say, we have three domains. Leadership agility, structural agility, and market agility. Leadership agility is the relationship that you have with authority in the organization. Structural agility is the relationship that you have with each other. And market agility is the relationship that you have with the wider, well, world, your supply chain. Remember, the customer's at the center. So market agility isn't necessarily the relationship you have with your customer, and maybe with your end users, but it's also with your suppliers and your vendors. Right? It's the entire supply chain that the market must operate within. Okay? So let's talk about leadership ability. Right? Um, I've got some interesting examples here, but I won't really go into them, because we've already had the art talk about some fantastic stories, and you've got Steve Nicking up talking about the age of agile and some stuff, so I'll let them focus on leadership agility. But this is the domain of servant leader. This is the domain of delegation. And I don't mean delegating work. I mean delegating outcomes. Authority and accountability that go hand in hand. You need both. This is not delegating, hey, I've got a piece of work for you. I, I need this report done by next Friday. Fantastic. That is delegation today. That is not leadership agility. Right? Delegation in leadership agility is we have to, we have to make sales. Right? I give that to you. That's on you. How you do it. Maybe you create a report. Maybe you do a presentation. Maybe you do song and dance. Right? I have delegated the outcome, the business outcome to you. You are empowered, I hate the word, but you are empowered with the accountability, with, which is what literally delegation is, but also with the authority. Right? It's on you to decide what, what you need to do. If you need to spend money, spend money. If you need to make something happen, make it happen. There are constraints, there are regulations. You don't have a free hand. Nobody has a free hand. Everyone has some level of constraints. But you do have autonomy. Within the constraints of the organization and the organizational processes and, and cliff limits and all those wonderful things that companies put into place, it's yours. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to tell you why we need it, the how and the what is yours. That is leadership agility. Structural agility. This is kind of the big thing at the moment. Right? Once upon a time, literally like four months ago, I was a consultant. Right? What do management consultants like to do? Restructure. Right? We love restructure. Why? Because it gives the perception of change. We shuffle a few people around, we've left the organization in a different configuration than we walked in, and then we've walked out again. Now, a good management consultant, that restructure will actually achieve something. Right? Not always what was intended, but it will, it will make some impact. Right? So structural agility is getting a bit of a, a, a buzz at the moment because teal, teal organization, Spotify model, right? half of you probably are starting to join squads and tribes now. Nothing wrong with that. Right? It's just this, this, the act of restructure is not structural agility. It's just a mechanism that one puts in place to achieve it. 
So what is structural agility? It's not just squads and tribes. It is about, well, let me answer that in two ways. Number one, we're talking about uh, the, the characteristics of an agile organizational structure. Right? And these are words you all know. Cross-functional teams. Nice and simple. Right? Right? Reduce, like, delegated accountability. Ownership. Wonderful, wonderful words. Right? These are the characteristics. But structural agility means look beyond your existing business models. Look, cross-functional teams does not mean we're going to get the developers and the testers in the same way. Cross-functional teams means we're going to put all of the skills necessary to achieve an outcome in the same team together. Not output, but outcome. And that's critically important. So if a business outcome, if I require a recruiter, if I require an accountant, if I require a technical writer and a graphic designer, da, 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 pick a hundred skills that you want, they are part of my, I will use the term, squad. Right? They are part of my team. Right? Now, seven plus one plus two, we still believe that, small teams are better, right? but those can be the execution units. Right? An outcome, a value delivery team, could be a hundred people, right? broken up into specific execution units, but that team, has the accountability and the authority to deliver on the outcome. That is fundamentally what structural agility is. Now, characteristics. Sorry, um, actual examples of this. You've got the obvious ones. Uh, who here has read Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Laloux? Right? Surprisingly few. For those of you who did not put your hand up, read the book. Right? There's a whole bunch of problems with the book, um, it, and it glosses over the downside of structural agility, of, of, of what he calls a teal organization. But effectively, the premise is there is an organizational model, which he calls a teal organization, which is a network-based organization. The structure of the organization is such that teams and connections between teams form and reform dynamically. Right? There are examples in the world. The great one is Morningstar. Morningstar is a blue-collar tomato processing factory in the United States. Raw tomatoes in one end, thin tomatoes in the other. There is no software in that organized world. Well, I'm sure in the back office there is, but that's not the purpose of the organization. This is an organization of thousands of blue collar workers and no managers. Right? The coordination is done organically by relationships between teams, networks, agreements in the supply chain. Right? I need to, you need to give me this so I can give them this. The decisions around who to hire, who to fire, who gets a pay rise. Decisions around which plant equipment needs to be upgraded, which needs to be repaired. That is made, uh, and there's a lot of different processes they put in place to make this happen, but this is not made by a manager. This is made in the organization by the members of the organization. Right? They form committees, they form agreements, there are charters and patterns that make these decisions, but there is no you have to be a manager or above to make that decision because there are no managers. There are other examples. Um, uh, Bertog, a healthcare organization in the Netherlands. Right? It is run by the nurses. Right? Here's an interest, and sorry, just as a side note, here's a very interesting thing about structural agility. Right? Organizations, and to Linda's point, right, this was not done with uh, scientific rigor. But organizations that run under many of these models will outperform organizations that do not. Right? There are some fairly decent studies that show that organizations that are perfect driven will outperform organizations that are financially and revenue driven. And I used to work for IBM, so I can keep you an idea of where I'm coming from. Organizations that are driven by, um, that have agility, that are able to uh, operate quickly in the market, right? up for those that are not. Oops, I don't want to too far. The structural agility, and, and it doesn't have, I've given you the extreme cases. Let's come back a bit. In your organization, there is already an agile structure. It's just hidden inside your current hierarchy, hierarchical structure. 
right? Think about the network that exists. Think about how many bosses you have. Think about how the relationships that you need to build in order to achieve something. Congratulations, that is your network organization. You've already found it. Now, you want to make it better? Bring it closer. Reduce those, those lines of communication. Either, make them, either bring them physically into teams, right? reduce the lag in that communication channel, make it faster, make it briefer, make it clearer. Right? That is how we get structural agility in an existing, very legacy hierarchical organization, or is how we, how we start. Right? We still need leadership agility. If, if you want business agility, right? restructuring to Spotify model is not going to help because you still need leadership agility. You still need the other forms of agility in there to help you. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. The last one under the connections domain is the market agility. This is the agility that exists in your supply chain. So let me give you two examples. All right. First of all, agile contracts. Who here is either a vendor of another organization or works closely with vendors? Most of you. Who here has what you would consider to be agile contracts? One of you. Fantastic. Go and see her. Agile contracts are hard, right? Because most contracts are, what do we do? Fixed time, fixed scope, fixed, um, fixed time, fixed scope, fixed price, right? That is not an agile contract. There is no agility in that. But let's go back to trust, right? I'm not going to go pure TNM because I don't trust you, right? If I'm IBM, you don't trust me with a blank check. There has to be some commitment in that contract. So here's a suggestion. Agile Contract 101, I could spend an entire 45 minutes on this, but I'm just going to give you the, a quick answer right now. The simplest form, unless you want to go purely with TNM, the simplest form of commitment-based contract for agile engagement is the following. Fixed price with commitments. Fixed price does not mean fixed scope. So it's going to be a million dollars, and these are the commitments that we put into place in the terms of this contract. Number one, MVP. All right, now, MVP means 20, 30% of the size of the contract, not 80, 90% of the size of the contract, as I've seen many, many, many times. All right, commitment number two, quality. We guarantee a certain number uh, level of defects um, in production. Right? We will not commit to defects in test. We want to find defects in test. So no measure should stop us from creating, finding, and rectifying defects in test. The measure should be in production. Right? Mean time to resolution. How quickly will we fix the defect that we find? Right? Now, um, uh, do we use velocity as a commitment? No. Congratulations. You've all at least passed that one. Velocity is a bad measure, except I can give you an example where velocity can be part of the good measure. Okay. So, the problem with velocity is it can be gained. But let's take another relative measure that we can use. We have story, velocity is the story point delivered per sprint. Right. So, story points is a relative measure. Right. This harder than this. This is one, so this is a two. Value points. Value points. This is more valuable than this. This is a one, so this is a two. Who estimates the value points? The business, the product owner at best, oh, sorry, at worst, the customer at best. Right? So the customer estimates the value points, and the team estimates the story points, bring them together. We call that ROI. Right? How are we going in terms of delivering value per time? Highest value, lowest effort should theoretically be done first, all other things being equal and dependencies not being taken into account. If you want to put into your contract a throughput measure, you can use cycle time, by the way, that's another one. Um, but if you want to put a throughput measure, do an ROI measure. Right? We guarantee a certain percentage of value to velocity ratio, right? based on whatever the baselines are agreed on. And then, what happens if you exceed that ratio, or under that ratio? We stop the contract. And you know what the great thing is? We want to stop the contract because the ROI has just gone negative. Right? 
So that is the only way you can put velocity into a contract. So let's go about mindset. Let me just check my timing. And I've got 15 minutes. Fantastic. Mindset. Three domains under mindset. Learning, collaboration, and ownership. Right. A learning mindset. Organization. You have the mother of this thing at the back of the room. She was the one who taught me about growth mindsets. I have literally no idea when I first saw you speak. Probably about six years ago. Right. Uh, growth mindset is key. Right? She, I will, as a side note, as a personal note, she has literally changed the way I raise my daughter. Right? My daughter is five years old and she has changed how I teach. <laughs> there we go. I've embarrassed her. Fantastic. She has changed how I raise my daughter. Uh, anyway, side point. You need a learning organization. Now, learning organizations are, or learning mindset, it's not just safe to fail. It's not just the culture of experimentation or, or uh, trialing. Right? That is a part of it, absolutely, but it is definitely not the totality. A learning mindset is also being able to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. Right? There are some organizations when, when a team forms, everyone will say, hi, I'm Evan, right? this is my role on the team, and my biggest weakness is getting me to shut up. That's true, by the way. Um, that is a learning organization. One that is willing to own up to weaknesses, own up to their strengths, and actually be willing to make an effort to improve on that. This is an organization of Kaizen, of continuous improvement. This is an organization of the retrospective. Right? These are all mechanisms that help us create a learning mindset. And you cannot have business agility unless you have it. Uh, I'll give you an example of where I've seen this uh, really apply. Um, it was a financial institution in Singapore. And they wanted a culture of safe to fail. And they tried the different things. They, because here's the problem with banks. You get what you measure. And what do you measure in a bank? Money. So people are incentivized to make money at all costs. And that has, if you look at what happened with Barclays, RBS, there have been some blatant abuses of that uh, motivation. Right? So uh, this organization didn't want that. They said, we want to create a learning mindset. We can use those words, but that's what they were trying to do. They want to make it safe to fail. So first things first, what did they do? The leaders tried to embody safe to fail. They would talk about their failures. They would make it, uh, they would make it easy to have that conversation. But here's the secret. Nobody likes to fail. Uh, you can talk about it if you like, but the more you enforce that conversation, the more someone's just going to pull out a, a trite answer. Oh, I brought down the test system because my code didn't compile. I find that was a failure, but realistically, what did you learn? So they tried a few other things, but what they ended up settling on was exactly what I said before. You get the behavior that you measure. So what did they do? They put in place a failure KPI. Very interesting. The KPI went as follows. Right? You must demonstrate that you have failed, and then obviously learns from that failure, at least once per quarter. Now obviously the level of the organization that you are in determined the size of the failure. A software developer is not going to bring the company to its knees, and at the same time, if the CEO said, I broke the build, we're going to have a different conversation about failure. Like, why is the CEO touching the build? Now, this changed the dynamic, because no longer was it safe to fail, it was compulsory to fail. And I got asked one question, right? What if I don't fail in that quarter? I don't get my bonus. Right? To which I only had one answer. Right? And remember, this is management consultant heaven. Right? The answer is, you're fired. Right? Why? Because either you're lying to me, right? or two, you're not taking enough risk. Both of which is not part of the culture that we want to develop. Obviously, I didn't tell them they were fired, but that was the, that was the principle. So this was a way that we tried to develop, uh, to measure a learning mindset. And once again, as I, as, as, and remember, safe to fail is not the totality of a learning mindset, it's just an element of that. The second domain is a collaboration mindset. And this is somewhat similar to structural agility, but it goes to the way in which we work. Right? Somebody, speaking of firing people, this is another thing that I somebody to say. 
that is not in my job description. All right? This is not an agile organization. You may not know how to do something, but we're working collaboratively. We are working towards a common outcome. Right? If you have to roll up your sleeves and do something that, hey, let's learn something new, or I'm going to go and do that job for a week because someone's just uh, called in sick and we have a, uh, we have a release next week, then that's what's got to be done. And this goes cross-silo. A collaboration mindset is not where you go, I've done my work, I've handed it over to the dev team, all right, it's with them. I have just abrogated my accountability, or I've tried to anyway. I've said, it's with them, I'm fine, I've done what I needed to do, it's with them. Go talk to them, don't bother me anymore. Collaboration mindset says, no, you own, if, if you touch it, you're part of it, till it's gone, until the end. And this, is the, and, and this is fundamentally where agile organizations, because you've got this accountability, because you have this authority and the autonomy that comes with that, right, it comes with you must collaborate. Right? You don't get a choice. You can't hand off. Right? I'll give you a good example, and this, and this covers a couple of domains. I was working with a trading organization, so, sorry, a software organization, um, also in Singapore. And this organization had a problem with their, uh, their customer satisfaction was low. Right? Um, what was basically happening was that the sales team were selling more than could be delivered. Right? Because the sales team were being measured or being paid on commission. They are being measured on the number of sales. And if they sold something that was either impossible to deliver or couldn't be delivered in the time or whatever reason, that wasn't their problem because they would handed the problem off to the dev team. Who got wrapped on the knuckles when they, the, the, the forecast wasn't met? Not the salesperson. They've moved on, they've got their commission, they're trying to sell the next thing, but the dev team. So this organization realized they had a problem, and so they did a couple of different things. So the first thing that they did was they got rid of the sales team. Right? Actually, technically, not quite true. They got rid of the team, but not the sellers. The sellers got embedded into the delivery teams. Right? Talking about cross-functional teams, this is about as cross-functional as it gets. Sellers embedded into the delivery teams, they became more account partners than sellers, per se, that they did have to go and build new business. Right? It, it improved collaboration, but there was a few things that, that was step one. Right? What was still happening was they were still trying to sell more. They couldn't escape it anymore, which meant their job satisfaction went down. But the dev team's satisfaction didn't really go up. So we just brought everyone to a really low level, which is not what you want to do. So a bit further, we said, why is this? Well, to my point earlier, you get the behavior that you know. So we got the sales API, so we changed it. So they were no longer paid on commission. The sales people would pay a salary like everybody else. Right? Bonuses were paid to the entire team. So first of all, team morale went up. Right? Because the worst thing you can have is one team member being paid half a million dollars for doing something, and they do all the work to build it, and you just get a salary. Right? So we brought everyone's salary to a base level, right? and there was a much smaller bonus. Right? The best sellers, their average annual take-home money went down. The worst sellers went up a bit, but everyone sort of um, ended up neutral. As a side note, we lost about 30% of the sales team when we did this. Right? But that was actually okay, because once we'd normalized the KPIs, once we'd normalized the, the incentives and, and the... Um, uh, uh, and the the, the motivations and the, fun, and the pay and all that sort of stuff, once we built it all together, a remarkable thing happened. Team morale went up, right? They started collaborating quite closely together, and repeat business from existing customers went up by 80%. And for those of you who don't know, right, it costs more to acquire a new customer than to sell to an existing customer. So if you can increase repeat business, Right? That is the best thing that you can do in an organization. So with that increase, um, uh, new sales went up by about 2 or 3%. It was a statistically insignificant increase in new sales. So that change in how that sales team operated was a fundamental shift in, fund in collaboration. It's why we made that change. The final domain, ownership. And that should be an ownership mindset, not ownership agility. Ownership mindset 
is not one of perfectionism. Right? I take pride in my work. I'll make sure it's done right each and every single time. Perfectionism is not the same as ownership. Right? But this is about making sure that I take pride in the work that we as a team do, that I as an individual do, and that I will make sure that we are going to serve the customer to the best of the ability within the constraints that we have. Right? If I can take a level of pride, I can't own it. And, I, and there's a question that you have to be able to ask. Right? Do you take personal pride and ownership in the financial health of your company? You don't have to answer. Uh, most of you, the answer is probably going to be, no, that's my boss's job. Right? That's not business agility. Right? Ownership means I'm going to take pride. Does it mean I'm, I'm going to ch stay in this job the next 30 years? No. Right? I, of course, I might leave in two years, but when I'm there, I'm going to take that ownership of the work that I'm doing. That is agility. So, this dimension, these nine domains, these three dimensions, I, as I said, this is not a framework. It's not telling you how to do anything. Right? Scrum, Scrum is process agility, a bit of learning agility, right? collaboration agility. Right? Beyond budgeting, you've got some leadership agility, you've got some technical agility, because accountants are agile too. Right? You've got some collaboration, learning, and ownership. Fantastic. Right? Uh, Spotify model, all well, that structural agility, and about it. Right? You want business agility? It's not one thing. Right? It, is a, it, is a, it is your organization coming together as a, as a almost a single entity and changing all little parts. Remember Evan's theory of agile constraints? Somewhere is your constraining factor. Right? And you can use something like this to help you go, if it's not process, if it's not IT, where is it in the organization, and what can we do to fix it? Thank you. Questions? Big voice. When the organization is new to Agile framework, that's where we, what I have observed is that we struggle with the collaboration. Why? Because yes. the top performer is always overloaded and the poor performer actually hide behind the scene. Now when the maturity goes up, it's well and good because everybody participates in that. Now, that's where the struggle comes that how we actually give a fair chance to the good performer over there. Okay, so two, so two suggestions with that. First of all, uh, introduce pair programming. Um, because you want to upskill the, the skill of all of the teams. And the program is not just for good and poor developers. You, you want people all different sets working together. Right? And, and what you'll see is that you'll see uh, your staff performers perhaps aren't as good as you think they are. They may be a good developer, but they may be weak in other areas, and you'll start to see a consolidation of skills across multiple teams. You also may want to consider something about self-selection. Um, there are organizations out there that will allow individuals to self-select into teams and projects and, and products that they're working on. And one of the advantages that you get is, first of all, they will get a sense of personal motivation because they have selected what they're going to work on. Uh, and, and there's entire me and there's books on self-selection to make sure you get the balance right and the skills right and all that sort of stuff. Right? But um, uh, when you do that, what you find is because you've got that personal motivation you've got mediocre performers who suddenly become much better, much more uh, actively engaged because they're personally brought in and personally motivated by the work that they're doing. Um, it's, and then the other thing is, uh, if, you're, if you really have a bunch of really low quality people, you've got a different problem. <laughs> right, yeah, so I understand that. Hopefully Thanks. that's not the case. Hopefully it's just a matter of skill and experience, in which case time, effort, pairing, self-selection will help some of those issues. Thank you. One last question. Only one. Uh, I ran. Hello. 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 So I'm quite interested to know that we can have something like failure KPI. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you see the current model... This was model, an Asian company, by the way. Yeah, the current model is like we always have a KPI that uh, your budget accuracy should be 99.99%, your defect should be this, 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 this. So this is first time I'm hearing. 
So, uh, I mean, do you have a case study or more example that once it is being implemented? So, I gave you one example. We've actually implemented fairly KPIs in four organizations um, in the past. So, and in each case, it's, there's been a positive outcome. Um, but I will actually go more fundamentally. Forget the failure KPI for a moment. You get the behavior that you measure. I've said this multiple times. Right? If all you're measuring is financial performance, you're going to be uh, optimizing purely for financial performance and not for customer need. Right? The KPIs that you have, or OKRs, KPIs, outcome profiles, pick a model that you want, right? need to be focused on what does the customer want from us. Right? The financial elements are nothing more than a metric. They're an indicator that we are serving our customer. They are not the measure, sorry, they are not the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So there's a more fundamental issue about what you're measuring and why you're measuring it. Um, and, and another thing around, uh, it, when you say your, your KPI is around money, right? uh, I'm gonna guess your organizational scorecard also has a customer satisfaction KPI. Most of it, yeah. right? Does anyone get fired if the customer satisfaction KPI is not hit? No? Do they get fired if the financial KPI is not hit? Maybe, probably. Right? So the incentives and, 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 the, and the penalties for not meeting certain KPIs are different, which means I don't give a damn whether we hit customer satisfaction because I'm going to get fired if we don't hit the targets for this quarter. So that's all I'm going to focus on. And it doesn't matter what other KPIs are put in place, that's the only one that really matters. Right? So the rewards and benefits for the KPIs have to be systemic, as in at a systems level, not just individual, which is you hit this one, great. You hit the rest, that's just icing on the cake. Right? Similarly, going back to why you exist, right? this, this idea of measuring what... I'll give you another example, uh, and I know I'm out of time, so I'll be very, very quick. I used to work for IBM, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. We made a change to the account model of how we operated with some of our big clients. Big, big vendors have accounts, teams of sellers and, and specialist skills that will go in and try and sell more stuff to that client. So we went into the client, and it's like, the, this, the account structure was based on IBM's product offerings, which is fine, but that's not, why, that's not how the customer wants us. The customer has a, has a problem that they need to solve. Right? So we shifted it and we said, okay, customer, what are your organizational scorecards? What's your KPIs? Right? And we gave those KPIs to our sellers. Right? So this changed the behavior. It was, and, and yes, they still had to sell a certain amount per quarter because it's still IBM, but I'm now no longer selling one product. I'm selling a product stream because I'm focused on you're my client. You're trying to achieve, a, uh, you're trying to release a new product, a new banking product to market. Great. Right? That is my KPI as well. And whatever I can do to help you achieve that is what we're going to do. My bonus relies on you being successful. Right? And that really changed the level of conversation in the organization. Right? It, it stopped being about, hey, we have a new, uh, a new product, please try and sell it. It became a how can we help them achieve their goal? And sometimes the answer was, you know what? You should go to this other organization because that product is going to help you right? rather than try and sell IBM every single time. Thanks. So I'm now completely out of time. If you have any questions about what we're doing with the Business Digital Institute, come up and chat to me after this. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs>